Hi, Lee. Hi, Jean. Hey, Harry. Hi, Thanks for joining us. We have two excellent poets with us today, Lee Rossi and Jean Kalonymus. Lee will read first and then Jean. Lee Rossi hates labels. Although he has lived in California almost all of his adult life, he is not a West Coast poet, not a beat, nor Buddhist, nor eco-poet, although once in a while you will hear echoes of Ginsburg, De Prima, Wayland, or Robert Haas. He is not a formalist, even though on occasion he'll write a sonnet, a villanella, a pantoon, a gazelle, a duplex, or even a golden shovel. He is not a poet, activist, although criticism of American politics and culture runs throughout his work. Unlike Whitman, he does not contain multitudes, but only his own mysterious self, its cacophony of ideas and opinions. Here's a splendid poet, Lee Rossi. Thank you, Harry. Yeah, I wonder who wrote that. Um, oh, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing Gene's poems as well, but before I get started, I'd like to pimp my new book. I have a new book called, or what is it called? It's called Say Anything. And um, yeah, it's now available at your uh, favorite local e-tailer. So, uh, oh, I should point out that the cover, this wonderful image, I'm very fond of uh, surrealism, I guess, um, is done by a, a Colorado artist photographer named Loretta uh, young Gautier. Um, she has many wonderful images. This is just one of them. Ah, let's see. Oh, so today I'm going to read a few poems about animals, about human beings and animals and about human animals. So let me start with a poem called Cricket. Oh, you know what? I should time myself. I am, ah, I am not very uh, together today. This is often the case when I do a reading. Um, ah, my timer. Start. All right, cricket. If I use the word God in a poem, does it mean I believe in God or that I don't? Once upon a time, God was the water we swam in. Do fish thank the water for letting them swim. When I was 17, I wrote my first poem, but stopped writing six months later. I didn't want to be a confessional poet with nothing to confess. Guilt, I had plenty of that, the way that tall grass has chiggers. My conscience sang like a field of crickets. It was only the sun, you might say, warming them like pots on a stove, as natural as banana skins turning black. But I wanted to believe that someone was watching my every move, keeping track in some record book. Don't you see, without some gentle jailer surveilling everything, my kind of life, small as a chigger or a cricket, would go unremarked. And now at 76, I don't know what to believe. I watched the grasses dry and whiten, the stream trickle to a standstill, and still icing that one field, the long grasses, the bright and withering sun. At the moment, I'm reading a book called Wild New World by a wonderful environmental writer named Dan Flores. Uh, it's a really good book, and I, I would encourage everyone to read it. But one of the things he says that struck me you know, was that um, human, humankind is the only animal that doesn't think it's an animal. Um, think about that. Many of us still believe that um, we are kind of next in line to the angels when it comes to being getting close to God. And, and if you think about it a little bit longer, you realize that that's probably has something to do with the way we treat the other inhabitants of the planet. 
Um, here's a poem about reincarnation. You know, you don't always get reincarnated as a person when you go away. It's called Gone Wild. Whenever a boy would disappear, they'd say he'd gone wild. Confident, he'd come back as a fox or a coyote. Never a gopher or a mole. If they lost a chicken, they'd say it was Cousin Tom. Our Billy the Barber's kid done it. That's why they never shot him, just shot at him over their heads or into the woods. It was like they were saying, we know you're out there and you're not coming back. We know you still need us, but don't need us too much. The girls, of course, never came back, not even as gophers or moles. Or if they did, it was just as something in the fox's mouth, something still alive, but just barely. All right, happy little poem. Um, okay, here's another poem about reincarnation. Um, I don't know if you believe in reincarnation, but this next poem does. It's called Instructions to My Teenage Self. The next time you go for a walk in the world, remember the stories you heard as a child. A girl goes to visit her grandmother. Two kids get lost in the woods. Those stories. Remember, the woods are not just woods, but the whole world. And everyone you meet there is either a wolf or a witch. They may not look like a wolf or a witch. They may look like your grandmother, some kindly old lady, or like some cool dude who knows his way around. They may even look like you. But don't forget the stories. All they want is to eat you, even your parents. By the time you get home, if you get home, you won't recognize them. Or rather, you'll recognize them for the first time. The wolf and the witch you've been living with all along. By now, you're part wolf, part witch yourself. How do I know? Who am I? I'm a bird, a bug, the woods, the wind, and that other part of you, the part that's left after all else has been eaten. No. Okay. I, um, once upon a time, I was a practicing Buddhist. Now I'm a Buddhist, but I don't practice. But I do like to imagine myself in the, <clears throat> um, in the um, Zen, larger Zen context sometimes. This poem, um, well, I can't help it. It's sort of a mashup. Uh, it's called Zen the Video Game. Mm. And it's got uh, six fairly lengthy uh, prose poems. So, but I'm only going to read two of them, level one and level 257. Level one begins at a mountain monastery overlooking the Napa Valley in Northern California. You are working in the organic garden with a group of monks. Your job is to loosen the soil with a shovel. You've never worked with your hands, so despite the cold, you are soon sweating. Suddenly you are attacked by a pack, by a pack of demons in the shape of wolves. You have barely a second to raise your shovel and smack the largest, nastiest one in the muzzle with your tool. He is momentarily stunned, but soon he anchors himself for another attack. Although your attention is focused on your demon, you notice that the others are busy with their own wolves. The bodies of wolves and monks litter the ground. When he attacks again, you will meet him with the sharp end of your shovel, delving his throat 
like the hard winter soil. That's level one. Here's level 257. At the beginning of level 257, you are human again. The monks will not let you into the zendo. You sleep in the outhouse and work in the garden. Your job today is to pick raspberries for the monks' breakfast. You walk the narrow rows picking berries. Bees fly past you. You know you will spend your next life as a slug if you eat a berry. But they are so juicy and ripe, and their purple juice stains your fingers. Your bowl fills with berries, and soon there are bees gathering to the bowl. You've always been afraid of bees ever since a bee stung you as a child. You spent a week in the hospital, a human turnip. Suddenly, you realize that these are not ordinary bees, just as a swarm of them masses above you. You stand your ground and let these killer bees, the dark cloud of memory, pass through you as if you were an open door. Yeah. Yeah. This next poem, although it does make constant reference to animals, is really a, a meditation on human relationships. It's called Rats and Squirrels. Um, and you can see from this poem that some people never graduate to the next level in their Zen video game. <clears throat> Sip of water here. <clears throat> um, last night, gale force winds buffeted the house. Squirrels clung to palm trees like shingles to the roof and rats cowered in their nests while the wind ruffled their fur like a mother stroking her baby's blanket. Only the wind cares for rats. A squirrel might be nutty, but there's something cheesy about rats. Even if her feather boa is ratty, uh, a squirrel's tail is fluffy, whereas a rat's tail is always naked as a stiletto. Who suffers their hair to the misery of a rat tail comb? Are there wrought, their wrought iron to a rat tail file with the poor in spirit and bank book? Who doesn't prefer the hopping vegan, always threatened, ever vulnerable, to the slinking nocturnal scavenger, bubonic pet, rodent of the apocalypse? Which is less forbidding? The animal world's Uriah Heap, squirreling away her hoard against winter's cruelty, or the Scrooge-like pack rat, miserly to no end or good, a thief at the mercy of his own compulsion. Does your boyfriend belong to a rat pack? So much the worse for you. When he couldn't keep a job or his driving license and his buck teeth seemed to glow in the dark. He was just squirrely. But now that he's stealing your cash and spending it on another girl, you know what he is. You don't need to say it. All right. Um, let's see. Here's a poem that comes out of my experience, kind of formative experience I had many years ago living in Germany. I occasionally read the German newspaper and uh, our items about Germany. And here was an interesting one. <clears throat> this is a quote from the independent newspaper in Britain. Sunbathers in a busy Berlin park were treated to the sight of a naked man chasing after a wild boar, which was carrying his belongings. Interesting. <laughs> My poem is called Boredom, but boredom is spelled B-O-A-R-D-O-M, right? Yeah. 
Um, all right. And it's in the voice of some one of these nude sunbathers. They're not there. Then suddenly you see them dash from the brush, a sow and two piglets, heading for the bag where you've stowed your clothes and lunch, some bread, a wedge of cheese, a pear. These relics of an earlier time when forests ruled the land and wolves ruled the forest here at Teufelse, Devil's Lake, surrounded by what remains of the forest rank and musky self, its permanent dusk, its spine and crumbling splendor, arms uplifted in permanent prayer. How long has this taming taken? You walk into a toy store, and there she is, soft and tiny, in the wild taller than a child. Our nephews and nieces in bed, cuddling the plush synthetics, her tiny plastic tusks, a threat only in the imagination. The girl in the red cape would know to listen for a sudden rustle in the bushes, what we dreamed, some rough beast in rut, and hurry in another direction, all of them away, and yet here we loll in the all together on the shore of the apocalypse at a beach called Instant Gratification, watching the spectacle, a spectacle ourselves, not even a pink triangle for cover, a naked man chasing naked animals naked too, except for a bright orange bag, gentle reminder of how long it took to achieve this indolence. Quickly, it might disappear. I should mention that in um, the Third Reich, um, yeah. homosexuals were um, forced to wear pink triangles to uh, indicate their homosexuality in much the same way that Jews were forced to wear yellow stars. Anyway, okay, I'm going to read a book, uh, a poem from an earlier book called Darwin's Garden. Um, since I was on the subject of Germany and witches, this is a a poem about a, a problematic love affair. It's got another one of those weird titles. Uh, everyone knows what a Liebes toad is. You know, it's where two lovers jump to their deaths, right? And, uh, and we all know what toadstools are. Well, this is called Liebes Toadstool. It was almost a religion. Word would spread from neighbor to friend, from friend to kin. And soon the woods would ring with the rattle of pails, with children and families, singles and couples in boots, scouring the green October gloom, the marshy undergrowth for any kind of fungus. You were there with another man's wife, almost a couple yourselves. What were you seeking, the two of you? You had no idea what she wanted aside from the clamor of sex. Was that all you wanted from this dour, self-questioning woman, the two of you as well matched as a pair of hand-wrought amateur candelabra? What glimmered then between you, wax stripping along the candle, along the slumped, imperfect blaze, pooling on the table where you ate? Your eyes were no match for the woman's, morals and chanterelles outwitting you with their GI, that is to say, genetic issue camo, dusky umbrellas and spongiform cones, all in khaki and taupe. They knew how to hide from your hungers, clumsy and self absorbed, but not hers. Back in her apartment, you lingered at the window sipping something tart as vinegar, while the patchwork of wood and high-rise receded into dusk. You listened as she toiled, <clears throat> as she toiled in the kitchen, the smell of onions and underbrush, wafting like some meal out of a fairy tale. What about her husband? When would he be home? You never thought of him, except when you were with her. Suddenly, you were struck with fantasy, 
The, br- the brown oleaginous blobs simmering in the pan were death cap. And like a witch in a Marishan who only seemed beautiful, she was fixing your last meal. He'd arrive and find the two of you stricken at the table. Who knew she was capable of such vengeance? Who knew you were so riddled with guilt? Okay. I think I have time for one more poem. So, this is again about an animal, a human animal, who might or might not be my daughter. It's called Butterfly. It's the damnedest thing, seeing some big name Hollywood actress on the screen getting ready to jump off a building or a cliff and knowing that's my girl actually doing the crazy stuff. When it comes to bodies flying through the air, she's the one they go to first. She's been that way ever since she was little, scaling her mom's étagère like it was some climbing wall. You never heard such a racket, her mom screaming about all her precious knickknacks, and the little girl laughing like it was Sunday morning cartoons. There was always casualties, usually the little girl's butt, but that didn't stop her. I come home from work and the old lady'd be in the kitchen telling me to go look for her. She'd lost the kid. How do you lose a three-year-old? I'll tell you, I start in the backyard. We have us a couple of apple trees, good size, and a magnolia. But I guess that was too simple, like them jungle gems at the playground. She was never interested in those. Then I tried the attic, but that was just for hiding, not climbing and hiding, which was her specialty. And sure enough, there she'd be, top of the closet, in in among the hats or flashlights, who knows how long. She never came out on her own, always needed someone to find her, already working on her legend. Back then, she was just a kid but everybody in the neighborhood said she was something else. Long before the barrel racing and dirt dirt bike jumping, I remember one time she was six or seven and one of the neighbors was having a backyard birthday party for one of theirs. A couple of tables, a bunch of chairs, a barbecue pit, in no particular order all over the lawn. And suddenly there she was standing on top of one of them tables and somebody's dad, Maybe it was me. I was pretty drunk. He's yelling at her to get her butt off the table. And she says, make me. Just like that. Make me. Defiant as a cockroach at 3 a.m. So whoever the damn fool was lunges for her. Misses her, of course, because she was off to the next table. Only instead of taking the direct route across the lawn, she hops from chair to chair before coming in for a landing. One foot in the cheek in the sheet cake. Too bad about that cake. But a nice portrait of the birthday girl. So the damn fool lunged again, missed again, landed in what was left of the cake because she's off, leaping from chair to table to barbecue like it was the most natural thing. And of course, all those things was getting upset and knocked over, but she just kept going round and around the yard, never once setting foot on the ground. Whatever she landed on, upright or upside down, she was on to the next thing, like she was a butterfly trying out all the flowers in the garden. That's when I knew I weren't never going to be the regular kind of dad. No, sir. I was going to be the dad you read about in the movie star biographies. The guy who, after you're done with the book, gets to pick up the pieces. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lee, for a marvelous reading. Your poetry is uh, lucid and sagacious, and and there's a simplicity and elegance and humor in it too. And you know, I love that last poem that you said. You, you know, you've always been such a wonderful poet, and you published a, a magazine that I always loved, Tsunami, years ago. And I'm always thankful for your reviews uh, when I read them. And uh, we have a few minutes left. 
Could you just tell us a little bit? I know some of them are evident in the poems you read, but your new book, Say Anything, could you just tell us a few of the main themes in that book and also how long it took you to write that book? Um, thanks, Harry. Uh, yeah, Say Anything started um, almost immediately <clears throat> after I published my, my last book, and um, uh, which was in 2019. That was the Darwin's Garden book. And um, uh, we were, uh, that was 2020, right? And we were all locked down and confined. And, um, and so this book was sort of an, my answer to that sense of confinement. Uh, I, I was looking for areas where I could, uh, areas of freedom. Of, and uh, I was discovering it in the imaginative freedom of these poems. And, and stories, you know, the, some of the uh, details come from my life um, as I've lived it recklessly over the years. But this, uh, this book has a lot more fairy tale and myth uh, mixed in with the, the biographical stuff. So the, that's, that's kind of how it developed. And, you know, and I come across a poem or I'd write something, I'd say, Oh, this fits or this doesn't, you know, I'm already working on another book, but, you know, that's in the future. Yeah. So I hope that answers your question. You know, you're always you always so visual and clear. I know you say you mix myth and fairy tales, but we're always right there with you. And we see, you know, the humanity of what it is that you're talking about. I always appreciate that. You're you know, you're very, uh, you know, precise in what you what you write. So um, how many books have you had published? What number is this one right here? Yeah, um, Say Anything is my fifth book. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm hoping to do at least one more. We'll see what happens. It turns out that back in uh, the, the aughts, you know, from 2000 to 2010, um, I wrote a lot, but I didn't publish very much. Uh, one, because uh, I was kind of shepherding the um, career of a, a friend of mine who was dying of cancer. And, you know, she was dying. Anne Silver, I don't know if you remember her. She was a wonderful poet. Um, she didn't publish a lot, but she tried, you know, and I helped her with her poems. And so I was working on her poems. And also my, my children were, you know, uh, they were very young. They were um, zero zero to 10 during that decade. And, uh, and so I don't know if you, what you remember about being a parent, but you know, that's, that's the heroic age of parenthood. And so I didn't have time to think about my own, uh, publishing my own poetry. Although, you know, I, I did write a lot and now I've been going through all that stuff, you know, piles, stacks of poems from way long ago and, and saying, well, this isn't that bad. Maybe I could turn this into a book, you know, and so that, that's kind of my next project. Well, it's been a wonderful time listening to your poetry and talking with you, Lee. I've always appreciated your intelligence and what you see and your uh, sense of tradition and also expanding the tradition with your work. And I also always deeply appreciate your care for your your fellow poets, you know, when you write reviews and your support of fellow poets. So. Thank you once again, Lee Rossi. Yeah, thank you very much, Harry. Our next poet is Jean Kalonymus. Jean Kalonymus began her career in the arts, first as a ballerina in training, and then as a member of the Martha Graham Dance Company. After dance, she became a dance journalist while also writing poetry and plays. She is an award-winning poet and playwright. Her poems have been seen online and in Poetry Journal, Askew Spillway, American Writers Review, Seppuku Quarterly, Your Daily Poem, among others. She's been a judge for Pen America and other contests. Here's a superb poet, Jean Kalonymus. Thank you, Harry. It's a lovely introduction. Um, I love, uh, thank you, uh, Lee Rossi. I 
don't didn't know your poetry, and it's wonderful mm -hmm. to encounter such a wonderful poet. And I would say that my um, myself was like your daughter. I was jumping everywhere. My father had a heart. one time he built us a tree house, and he couldn't find me. And I I was very young. I was like four years old, and they didn't want me to climb the tree. But I, there I was in the tree. So it's wonderful. That there's such a segue here. Um, anyway, um, and I, I loved your Zendo poems and just taking the journey with you. Thank you. Um, so I am going to, I'm in the process of, of publishing a book uh, called, I don't know if you can see it, Living the Dream. Oops. It's about my life as a dancer first as a ballerina in training, and then as a member of the Martha Graham Dance Company. And uh, the poems I'm going to read are from, like, the start of my life as a dancer when I was five years old in the late 40s, and then through the 50s and through the 60s. Um, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, so the first poem... I'm going to read is called Imprint. Um, a pint-sized six-year-old squirms at the piano while the teacher instructs her how to play. Hot cross buns, a three-note melody. <laughs> at the end of the third lesson, preoc sorry, preoccupied with ballerina Maria Talchi, who she knows from a photo on a wall at her ballet school, she deafens to the notes. At the end of the third lesson, she overhears the teacher, Mrs. Roberts, you're wasting your time. <laughs> Every time I teach your daughter a tune, she leaps off the bench to dance. In the picture, Tall Chief's head is crowned with swan legs iconic white feathered headband. The photo calls out to the girl, a lighthouse illuminating curiosity where imagination takes the lead. Mm. Heaven bound. This is, uh, this is from the 50s. This is the start of the 50s and my training more professionally as a, a ballerina. Heaven bound. You are my dream catcher, mom. My desire to study dance caught in your third eye's web. At eight years old, you knew to take me to ballet arts in Manhattan, a serious dance studio where kids and professional ballerinas were trained. Some teachers were Russian emigres from Sergei Diaghilev's Sensationnel Ballet Russe when in early 1900, Václav Nijinsky astonished Paris and the West. His entrechadis was a vertical jump where he crossed his legs 10 times while airborne. Heaven bought, bound, why would he come down? Many, companies emigrated, many company members emigrated to New York their shaman's knowledge of grace harked back to two centuries to court dances from Peter the Great's reign. George Balanchine was another import. He believed you put a group of men on stage, you have a group of men. You put a group of women on stage, you have the world. I wanted to be part of that world reach transcendence through physical extremes, what Mr. B believed. My first important teacher was Madame Vera Nemchinova, who would crack her cane against the wood bar and yell, I was Bolshoi. As if our Raggedy Ann bodies were insults, the wood bar shook with her past glory and I'd work harder to suck in my belly. Or from a standing position, I'd cramp my overarched foot when I slid it to the side. 
in Tandu. Madame sometimes recognized my efforts and would ring, wishing a tempered joy through my body. Oh, Mom, the day of remembrance is the day you led me to ballet arts, where the dream you caught landed at the ballet bar. Thank you for sending me through doors that opened the rest of my life. Dear Marcia, we were a matched pair. The blood said so when we sliced our thrum thumbs in the dressing room. At 14, I couldn't compete with your ripening body. Mine was a plank, yet we twinned in ballerina talent. You with your, her per your perfect ballet body alignment and strong feet arched like hooks, and me with my 32 fortes or whip turns where each landing before the next one was an exclamation point. It was as if some force were driving me out of myself to leave all boundaries behind. What we hid from our parents was the plan to quit school at 16 to join the Metropolitan Opera Ballet. When we doubted ourselves, we were sure we'd be asked to join this progressive company when in 1951, Janet Collins became the first African-American to be a full-time soloist in ballet's white world. Dear Janet Collins, a slip of a woman, we'd sometimes watch rehearse before afternoon class, absorbing how she moved. The ease with which she executed the most complicated choreography was a language our bodies longed to speak. Em and I were going to live together in the great city of New York, and that plot kept us going through, <clears throat> through a gloomy and spotted adolescence. Oh, Marcia, everywhere we turned, we stretched towards the invisible light. This was the love we shared, a dancer's life, millions of spinning miles clocked on her odometer. This poem is uh, uh, dedicated to Sir Frederick Ashton. Um, I was, uh, in 1953, these, uh, what was then the Saddler's Wells Ballet Company, which was now, um, which is now the Royal Ballet, because uh, Queen Elizabeth gave them a royal charter in 1962. And Sir Frederick Ashton uh, was knighted uh, in 1962 for my guardian angel. I relieve your kindness in stillness. Four 14 year olds rehearsed for the first time with Britain's world famous Sadler's Wells Company. Prima ballerina Margot Fontaine will perform as Princess Aurora in Sleeping Beauty. Margot Fontaine being on stage with this untouchable goddess, ballet's holiest of wholeness. In stillness, Allison, Marcia, Wendy, and I tremble, wait for the cue. We are masked mice who wheel in a creaky wood carriage carrying you, Mr. Ashton, as Carabos, the wicked fairy godmother. We lower the cart, scurry to one of the carriage's four wheels, hop, scurry to the next one, hop, repeat twice more as our hands at our mouths twiddle like whiskers. In stillness, the evil fairy's presence, a hawk-like beak nose, her shiny black dress with a wingspan perched to attack us, greasy black feathers, her body crawling with insects and foot-long gold claws. She dooms the court and the princess to 100 years of death, I mean, sleep. In stillness, your lilting British accent saves me like a tender love song. Girls, says Sir Frederick Ashton, if my costume scares you, remember, underneath, it's just me in rehearsal clothes.
This was the first, uh, this happened, uh, my first identity crisis when I was 16. Uh, I was called into my um, ballet teachers, of whom I was one of her protégés, to tell me something terrible, life-changing, lost. Beware when your ballet teacher invites you into her dressing room. Beware this inscrutable woman with her clipped British accent, dressed in gray slacks, gray shirt, ballet slippers, and her gray hair always knotted at the nape of her neck. Respect Mar Margaret Crass, who's given her life to training dancers, among them the young Margot Fontaine and dancers, choreographers, Frederick Ashton and Anthony Tudor before she came over and crossed the pond. Beware when at 16, Miss Crass twists Cupid's arm, says your hyperextended knees prevent you from becoming a professional ballerina as she points to muscles unwanted sprouting above your knees. Beware the shockwaves as your organs leave your body. There go your dreams of quitting school, living with Marcia, and you two joining a ballet company. Miss Krask is schooled in anatomy and kinesiology, how English ballet teachers are trained. Respect her when you're back at Nana and Gramps' apartment, taking out the garbage, heaving it into the incinerator, and as it plops down 20 floors, you listen to the sound, disappear, and your life is in flames. Beware the death trap elevator, clack, 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 as you ride down five floors, leave through the backstage door, and ask, is this forever? Beware the tolling bells, you'll never be good enough, beginning, middle, and end of story. Beware of walking on the knife edge of your soul. So now I'm gonna segue into the 60s and I I never told, it took me about six months from my mother. I hid it all from my mother and my family that this was happening and well, it was pretty bad. Anyway, but when I went to college, uh, Hofstra College in the, in 19, uh, in the 60s, um, one of the things you had to do was take gym as a, um, you had to have gym to graduate. And uh, one of the, one of the possibilities was dance. They had dance as gym. And this woman, uh, young Hawaiian, uh, Chinese woman, uh, Pat Leong, uh, taught Martha Graham technique. And that was it for me. <laughs> anyway, this is about Martha, the queen. There she stood, Martha Graham, queen of all she surveyed. We students, her court, stood at attention when she walked in. The queen nodded, signaling us to sit on the floor and nodded, singling, and the queen nodded, signaling for Bert, her demonstrator, to put the soles of his feet together in butterfly position. She'd say, and, in a voice that came from her banged up toes, and class would formally begin. What a queen, sometimes benevolent, when she correct softly a student, sometimes cruel when she curse or smack us, sometimes whimsical when she tweet britzy britzy, her favorite nonsense syllables, and sometimes luminous when she'd watch thirty or so students doing the technique she created during her lifelong love affair with dance. Phaedra, Jocasta, Clytemnestra, young bride. Martha was a woman who embraced all women. Though she might have said, 
I created those roles because when I began in the 1920s, there was little suitable for me to dance. Martha Curl choreographed because she needed to perform. And from that desire, an empire was born. Dear Martha Graham, I swallowed your every breath and word. When born again into the light of beginner, I hungered for your milk to nourish and grow my previously schooled ballerina's body, heart, and mind. My need for your attention first as a scholarship student and then as a member of your company paralleled others' desires. Look at me, Martha. Look at me. You were my passion, my devotion, and despair. It took me so long to be asked to, into the company. Your creation's the reason for shifting my dream of life from marriage to the dancer cells multiplying in my soul. I was blessed with a runaway love I could not control. The older forgave the younger me for how I excised my husband from my life. I believed in a bigger design. I believed in every gun pu gut punch into contraction and freedom into release. I believed in the use of the flexed foot. I believed in the first, first third of class as a half hour warm up on the floor. Starting in child's pose, I deep breathe into contraction, hinge backwards, my body suspended over the heels, and the light like water flowing through me as I grab hold of my heels, then thrust my pelvis forward into a, a steely arc of beauty. From every moment, a sea change, every moment, a dangerous slide into the birth canal of your art. This short poem is about drugs, which we were, were plenty in the dance world. Uh, again, we're in the 60s, 1960. Freddie Herco, 1936 to 1964. On speed, downtown dancer, Freddie leapt from a window convinced he could fly. Okay, this one, next one is about a dance I love to perform. It was, uh, the title of the poem is How the Light Got In, and it's about the Oedipus myth, uh, which you probably all know about. When Oedipus was born, there was a prophecy that you know, he needed to die because he was going to marry his mother, and he was going to kill his father, and marry his mother. A shepherd took him up to the hills, uh, did something to his heels to make him stay there. But uh, a shepherd, I'm sorry, a shepherd freed him and he lived and he lived the prophecy. And Martha Graham's night journey is based on this myth. One, dancers like glints of steel, wing-footed messengers, a female chorus, Twelve racing feet, six cupped hands inscrib inscribed on our taut, flat palms, Jocasta and our Oedipus's doom. When a curtain descends after image is what's left, the whole cloth of Graham's ill-fated love life with a man much younger. Partner, the beauty of our sculpted bodies leaving me in tears. Two, those bison jumps, we call them, arms bent at the elbow, at the elbows, leaping four times from a crouch, then high jumps with bent front leg and back legs, the image of hovering monsters. I danced out of myself with such ferocity, I wondered what inner fire I was trying to pull out, to put out. Graham's extreme choreography sending me to a place beyond language. My body filled with astonishment's pleasure when the force of six female dancers embodied one. 
devotion, as if honing a dancer's body were a religious light right, as if extreme exercise could turn flesh into spirit, where military precision leads to beauty and eloquence. Embedded in these daily devotions are prayers peppered with the power of Judgment Day. May my plies strengthen my core. May my chest expand to the sky. May my gut deepen my contractions and releases. And thank you for the discovery of a little known secret when at the top of a leaf, leap, I widen my split as if my legs sprouted wings. Two, in Martha Graham's Diversion of Angels, a chorus of four women splay their chests through their encircled arms. The ecstasy and beauty of desire in a movement flash. And my last poem is titled, well, it's, uh, Martha Graham, the stars of Moscow's Bolshoi Ballet in the Cold World. Cold War, rather. This poem will tell you how Martha was revered throughout the world, even through behind the Iron Curtain. Martha Graham and the stars of the Bo Moscow's Bolshoi Ballet and the Cold War. That once in a lifetime fall day in 1963, when the Cold War warmed East 63rd Street, at the Martha Graham School of Contemporary Dance. That unforgettable day when Ekaterina, Ekaterina Maximova and Vladimir Vasilyev, the wife and husband stars of Russia's Bolshoi Ballet, performing at the Metropolitan Opera House, were given permission by the Russian government to take a modern dance class from Martha Graham. That Chabon chilling day, when four squat body officials, one female translator, and three scowling KGBers sat on Isamu Noguchi's kidney-shaped low wooden benches, guarding their country's treasures. And yet defections here, the reminder of Nureyev's 1961 escape from the Kirov Ballet to England still fresh. That day when two prima ballerina dancers with the skill and beauty of Olympian gods shared a, foreign, for, set, shared a foreign movement language and spent half an hour warming up on the floor instead of at the bar. That, per, that perpetually surprising day when Martha Graham's signature movement, the contraction, the contraction and release became a diplomatic peace offering. That day, after a class composed of advanced students and company members, Martha invited us into the garden to welcome the Russians. We gave them our best smiles and through the translator, thanked Maximova and Vasilya for coming. That day when the star took Martha by the elbow and brought her to her bulging dance bag, Maximova reached in a pocket, pulled out a 25-year-old wrinkled photo of Graham from Letter to the World, 1940, her dance based on Emily Dickinson's Love of Life. That moment when she showed Martha the photo, her wet eyes seeming to say, you inspire me, you give me courage, then placed it over her heart and squeezed Martha's hand as if she'd been waiting for this moment all her Iron Curtain life. That once-in-a-lifetime day when we were so moved that neither the KGB nor the language barrier nor the Cold War stopped the flow from spreading throughout the world. Thank you. Thank you for such a luminous reading. Gene, your, your poetry is, uh, you know, as you said in one of your poems, you said a language our bodies yearn to speak. And you have certainly, through your words, shined a light and let us see what a ballerina's life is like. There's so much 
passion and devotion and discipline and precision in your poetry. And it really uh, is thrilling. It just really lifted me up and it was so clear. And, uh, you know, I've never heard somebody just put that life, you know, a dancer's life can be very esoteric. <laughs> uh, a lot of us don't know about what goes on in there, but you just have given us such a, you know, a transfixing and there's also a tenderness. And, you know, I just appreciate, you know, all the work that you've gone into, uh, not only as a dancer, but also as a poet. When did you write your first poem? Oh, gosh. Um, when did I write my first poem? Years ago, maybe. Um, when I was, when I left dance and I was 29 and there were issues that I, I had to leave and um, I was fiddling around. I didn't know what I was going to do. And I just started scribbling. And um, I wrote a poem. I wrote a book of poems that won, um, eventually won Southern Oregon's poetry verse, because it was a verse play about my the divorce of the the fall of my first marriage. And and then I had to make a living. <laughs> So, uh, cause, um, and I went out, I became a freelance dance, dance journalist, which, you know, does not pay very well, but, um, uh, I worked in New York city. It was amazing. The, um, the amount of stuff that I worked for the New York council on the arts, uh, going around researching companies that they had given money to. And I had to write a report. Um, there were a lot of, uh, I were, I did a col column for Dance Magazine, and there were a lot of small little, there was a New York dance column. I mean, there was a lot, and you got paid, you know? So, and then, um, and then I, um, and then I segued into dance, uh, into plays and poetry and plays. My plays got a lot of, I have one play that I did about this very primitive mysteries, which I didn't read about, um, that went to Edinburgh and um, New York. Uh, um, it's a play about what it was like <laughs> to uh, dance primitive mysteries in 1964. And Martha did this dance in 1931. So we were a very different bo body of dancers. And anyway, I think I've lost your questions. <laughs> I get so lost in all of this. <laughs> and can I interrupt just for a second, Harry? Absolutely. Gene, I just wanted to say hi to you. It's Bob Beecher. Hi, Bob. <laughs> hi. Hi. Uh, both, uh, this is to you and Lee, really enjoyed this hour of amazing poetry. Thank you. Um, yep. I appreciate you joining Harry on his show. and. Gene, nice to connect or reconnect with you. We've spoken on the phone, but we haven't seen each other in a long time. So yes. yeah. thank you. Thank you, Bob. Yeah. Bob's my connection. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. I, I love the, the enthusiasm and the the uh, the exhilaration of your writing, you know, and it, as it communicated you know, your love of dance and movement. It was really very compelling. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Lee Rossi and Gene Colomos. We have to move on. Television waits for no man or no woman. And there's a show <laughs> coming up. But and we're very <laughs> pleased and we're, we're just honored and so happy for the wonderful poetry that you both gave us. I learned a lot about your lives and also your imagination and your vision. So thank you for a, a marvelous reading. And I just want to, before we go to the next show, I want to announce next Tuesday, we have two superb poets with us, Ed Friedman and Todd Colby. So once again, thanks to Lee Rossi and Gene Colomos.